Hey, let me ask, have you ever got a weird gift? How many people got a weird gift before in their life? It was my birthday yesterday, and thank you very much. And uh, I didn't get any weird gifts. Did someone say 25? I like that person. Promote them, make them a pastor. And uh, I didn't get any weird gifts yesterday. Got great gifts. Please keep them coming. And, uh, <laughs> but, but it did remind me as I was opening some gifts of this one time I got a God gift. Yeah, don't know what that is? I didn't either until someone came to me and they told me that God told me to give you this gift. Now, I was thinking, oh, this is amazing. This is the first time this has ever happened. God told them to give me a gift. And I started to think, I wonder what God wanted to get to me to interrupt someone's life in such a way that he would use them as a vessel to bring me a God gift. And I thought it's a God gift. This has got to be a Rolex or something, you know, because... Because God ain't limited, right? Like, there, He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. There's no limitation. It, surely it's got to be like an Omega or it's got to be something amazing. And, and, and so I was fully ready and I, I looked at the box. It looked like a watch shaped box. I thought, this is it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I got it. I was so excited. I just opened it in front of him. And to my surprise, it was a, a little copper bell. And I said, what's this? He said, it's a copper bell. I said, I know that. Let me ask better, why? Why did you give me a copper bell? And he said, oh, because, you know, if you put it on your motorcycle, it keeps the gremlins away. That nervous laugh, I did the same thing. I was so confused. I said, you're telling me God told you to give me a copper bell to keep the gremlins away. I said, I don't know if I'm more disturbed at the fact you believe in gremlins or the fact that God needs a copper bell to keep them away. How many people know that's a weird gift? Not the gift, not the what, but the why. The fact that God told him to do it. That's what made it weird. Had he just given me a copper bell, cool, thank you. But the fact that he told me that God told him to give it that, that's weird. That's weird. That ain't even the weirdest thing that someone's told us God has told them to do. When we were in young adults ministry, uh, Kira and I, there was a guy in our young adults ministry who'd freshly, he was in the military. And uh, I remember I was there when he told Kira that God told him he was going to marry her. And before she could respond, he even said, and I've got to tell you, I'm prepared to wait seven years and seven years again. Wonder where he jacked that from. Jacob. <laughs> Kira didn't even have to respond. I intercepted. I said, hey, fool, uh, <laughs> that ain't it. I said, you ain't going to marry her. I'm going to marry her. And the truth of the matter is, you ain't hearing from God. You're hearing from the devil. That's what I said. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Just had to make it clear. It's very confusing. <laughs> it's so strange. It's so strange what we claim God said. The things that we put on God, the things that we say God said, when God didn't really say, but it's when we say it so that no one can argue it. And it's frustrating when, I think the frustrating thing is when people say God said, they say it so that you can't debate them. And the funny thing is, I I would say that I, you know, we all pray here, we're all believers, but I, I would say that on an average prayer person, I'm right up there with the prayer amount. And all the times I've prayed, God has never been that detailed as people are when they come to me with what God said. I find people come to me with a clear articulation of all the ventures that they're going to start and the directions God's going to take and the twists and turns along the way and what they're prepared to do in that moment, in that setting. And I'm like, I've moved countries on less than that in response to God. Are we here, church? If if your neighbor's silent, that means they do this where they say God said just as an excuse so that no one can talk them out of it. And you're freaking us out. You're freaking us out. Stop saying God said, because we're worried. We're worried that if God's speaking to you in that much detail, why isn't he speaking to us? That's what we're worried about. So holy and so righteous. Maybe I could say something really offensive or abrasive today. Maybe you want to get your pens ready to write this down, but this is my statement. God's not trying to tell you what to do. God's 
not trying to tell you what to do. Are you leaning in yet? Now, before you get offended at me and want to walk out the back doors, let me make sure I take the next several minutes to qualify that statement with some scripture today. So stay with me for a moment because I'm going to build a framework around the way God speaks. And to start with, from a fundamental level, you need to know that God is a yes God. Would you look at your neighbor real quick and say, God's a yes God. You need to know this. You need to know this at your core. God is a yes God. And what might seem contradictory to you in your previous church experience and your religious upbringing, God is very much a yes God. Now, now, I can see how it would be easy to characterize God as a no God. When I say that God is a yes God, I can understand fully how that would put you out of kilter with what you've experienced because maybe your whole life you viewed God as a no God. I mean, let's just take, for instance, the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, eight out of the ten are thou shalt not. Let's read them. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not cover, covet, and, and nine and ten, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, and honor thy father and thy mother. Now add to that the Christian expectation to live holy, not having sex outside of marriage or engaging in same-sex relationships or by using bad language among other things. It's easy to see with all these restrictions that God would seem like a no God. Not to you as the believers, but to people outside of the church who are looking at the church, it's easy for them to consider, well, God is a no God. However, what we know as the believers, in reality, what seems on the surface like a restriction is actually God's protection so that we can live a life free from the chains, the bondage, and the curse that are connected to those things. Are you with me? Are you with me? In fact, Paul emphasizes this in verse 19 by saying that, in Christ, it's always yes. Like that's bold, Paul. Always yes. Not even like most of the time, yes. Like how is it that God is always yes? That challenges me. I don't know if I would have been as bold as the Apostle Paul to claim that God is always yes. Surely there are some situations where God's like, uh-uh, that's not me. I'm sure there are some situations where it's not a yes, it's a clear no, but Paul says he's always yes. I want to spend a little bit of time helping convince you that God is always yes, as the apostle says, because when it comes to God, even what seems like a no is actually him revealing to you or preserving you for an even bigger yes. Now, I want you to accompany that understanding today with something we established last Sunday around God having a plan and a purpose for each of us, otherwise known as God's will. And what can actually create some tension is the fact that God being a yes God and the fact that he has a will for you is also the fact that he doesn't just tell you what to do. That would be so simple of God to just tell you what to do. That would be easy for all of us, wouldn't you agree? That take the mystery out of it, take the tension out of it, and because I want to do it, so God, just tell me what it is, and I'll do it. Just tell me what to do, and, and I'll go ahead and do it. I'll change my life. I'll reorient myself. I'll, I'll change my business, my plan, my school, everything about my life to do your will if you would just tell me. That would be easy, wouldn't it? God doesn't do it that way. In fact, I know what you're thinking. Pastor, God does do that. It's all through his Bible. Instances where God clearly told people what to do. And you're correct. For instance, you got Noah. Anybody know a guy? <laughs> Noah. God clearly told him to build an ark. Come on, let's go back to our children's church experience. God told him to build an ark. What about Abraham? God told Abraham to leave your land and go to a land that I would show you. What about Moses? Come on, you know the story of Moses. You've seen the cartoon. God literally told him, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. There are many instances in the Bible, Pastor, where God tells people what to do. Yes, I agree with you. On the surface, you would be right. But there's actually 
more to these directions from God and to fully grasp it, we actually need to build a basic biblical foundation if we're going to see deeper into what God is actually doing. Because honestly, while people often want to hear God speak to them, they miss the fact that God has already been speaking through His Word. The same people that are asking, I can't hear God speak, it's because you're failing to read God speak. God has already spoken through His Word. And when you're approaching the Word of God, it's kind of important to have, as I just said, a a basic biblical understanding. This will actually help you appropriate what God is saying through His Word. For instance, the Bible is broken up into two parts. Can we go real basic for a moment? Is this going to be helpful for anybody? Any, any brand new believers that are unashamed that I need all the ba- biblical knowledge I can get? Anybody else in here? Okay, everyone's too spiritual. All right, where's Vox Gen at? Vox Gen? Actually, I know Pastor Ben and Jackie, they're probably more spiritual than the rest of us. Let me talk to the person who's hiding in the back. There's two basic parts, two parts to the Bible. For instance, you have the Old Testament with 39 books and the New Testament with 20, 25, 27, can I get 28? Any, any, 27 books. Thank you, front row of pastors. That's how the Bible's broken up and what you're going to find in the Old Testament. It focuses on revealing the creation story, the fall of man, and of course, is centered around the Old Covenant amongst other things. In the New Testament, what you're going to find is it really kind of focuses on God's redemptive plan, salvation. It reveals the New Covenant amongst other things. Now, the Old uh, Covenant was a covenant that was established between God and Abraham. God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to be your God, and I'm going to carve out from all the nations of the world my very own nation. They're going to be my very own possession. To them, I can show my power. I can reveal my protection, and I can show them my provision. He said, I am going to be their God. I am going to go before them. That was the covenant that was set up between God and Abraham. It was a covenant that was extended through Moses as God called Moses to bring his people up out of captivity from Egypt. And we see this covenant extended throughout the Old Testament. A powerful story of God revealing who he is. In all these instances, God wasn't just instructing them what to do. It wasn't so much about them fulfilling a big task list that God had. It was about God revealing some things. He ultimately wanted to reveal his covenant. His covenant being, I will be their God. I will go before them. I will make a way. So every situation he led them into was a greater dimension of him proving his covenant. Every situation that they found themselves in was another dimension of God showing that he was their mighty warrior, that he would make a way in the wilderness. He could draw, he could make a path in the wilderness. He could draw water from stone. He could provide miraculously for them. It was God revealing he was their provider, protector, and all powerful God. And he lavished it upon them too. We even see this with Noah as they were building the ark. It was ultimately the power of God and the protection of God in one setting. God revealing who He was to His people and the nations of the world. Now, under the new covenant, we also kind of had God giving certain people some instructions through a variety of ways. I mean, for instance, we learned last week with the Apostle Paul that the Holy Spirit would literally guide him and direct him on his missionary journeys. But you don't just have the Holy Spirit guiding and leading the apostles and different people. You actually have angel moments too, by the way. They're really cool to read read about, like where angels come and they deliver the, the message of God to the people of God. They give instructions. Even angels do some work. They ain't just lazy. They actually do some work. They, they open prison doors and they usher people out of prison. And it's crazy stuff. So, so there is clear instances in the Bible where God tells people what to do through different means gives them instructions, speaking directly to them. But similarly to the old covenant, but with an added element, what we see under the new covenant is that God is not only revealing who He is, but now, because of this new covenant, also revealing who we are. Build it with me. Keep taking notes. It's not just God proving who He is. God's plan in directing us is to reveal who we are. I've got 30% of the congregation. We'll get there. Some of you are still skeptical. I know Jeremiah, 
29.11, God has a plan for me. He does. But it's not the plan you think. I'll, I'll qualify that because this is important understanding when approaching God's will and knowing what God says. Truth is, my wife loves me. I know this. She tells me all the time. Literally a dozen times a day, at the least, Kira tells me when we finish hanging up on the phone, love you. Like, I wish you walk down the hallway, love you. Yeah, love you too. And literally, we, we say love you so much. One time, we were, I feel like we're saying love to each other so much, we asked, are we going to water this down? Because we just, we just fling it out, you know what I mean? Like three times in one conversation, we just tell each other, love you, love you when you wake up, love you when you go to bed, love you all the time, just love. And, and, and we, we thought, like, let's, maybe we should get a different word so we don't dilute that one. And then we couldn't think of it, so we just stuck with love. That's amazing. Now, what would be toxic in our relationship? would be if I processed her telling me she loves me because she wanted me to do something. That'd be a toxic relationship. Where every time she says, I love you, I'm like, well, okay, what do you want? I love you. Oh, you need trash taken out or something? What a toxic relationship that would be. But it's the way we approach God, like as if God loves us because he has this long list of tasks that he needs a workforce of believers to do, and he wants us to find out what he wants us to do so that we can fulfill his will and be loved by God. That is how we approach God. That ain't the way God works. Are you here today? I, I don't know. 9.30, we're loving this sermon. 9.30, we're getting revelation. Because that's how we approach God, like as if God loves us because he has a plan for us which is ultimately saying that God loves you because he's got something for you to do for him. And God's got a celestial list of things to do before the end of time that he has to get, he's a busy God, a lot of people to save, a lot of people to do, I need a workforce, so let me convince them all that I love them and I've got a will for them. And if they would just find that my will, then they would do what I need them to do. That's toxic. That's toxic. Look at your neighbor, that's real toxic. Just, just tell your neighbor, it's real toxic. There ain't nothing toxic about God. He loves you. You know why my wife wants me to know that she loves me? It's because she wants me to know I'm loved. Because when I know I'm loved, I'm more confident. When I know I'm loved, I'm way more courageous. When I know I'm loved, ain't no, don't, I don't care who's against me. My wife loves me. And at the end of that, I go home to her. She loves me. That's why God wants you to know he loves you, so you would be loved, that you would walk confident, courageous, bold, audacious, knowing that my God is for me. Who does it matter who's against me? Doesn't mean there's nobody against you. It just means they don't compare to the power of God because his love is so powerful that it doesn't, can't compete, can't compete. So this is powerful orientation to understand when we're approaching the will of God, by the way. Believe it or not, sometimes we approach the will of God in a, a way where we, we kind of filter it through the sum total of God's will is connected to what he wants us to do. What is it that you want me to do? That, that long list of tasks, what's my portion, God? I want to know it. I want to do your will. So tell me what you want me to do. I really want to kind of confront that thought and hopefully arrest it today if my purpose is achieved because there's a much better question to ask when approaching the will of God. Instead of asking what, like the little bell, ask why. Write that down. Instead of asking what, because it's obvious what God's will is. What, what God wants us to do in life, He already told us. It's a great commission. Go into all the world and baptize everybody. You know, you know, he, he makes it very, very clear what, but the better question is actually, why have you got that for me? See, there's an amazing passage in Scripture, a passage of Scripture in Galatians that says this. This is going to reveal a much deeper understanding around God's will. It says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Think of it this way. I love this. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up. And even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. Talking about the old covenant. That's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, talking about the new covenant, 
God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Check this out. And because we are his children, God has sent us the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call Abba, Father. Now, check this out. You are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Check this out. God's will is that we would be co-heirs with Christ as adopted children. This is critical to your understanding of the way God wants to speak to you. That you were employed to fulfill the task under the old covenant. Under the old covenant, there was a job to do to fulfill what God had called you to do. But under the new covenant, you're not a slave any longer, you're a son. Under this new covenant, you are a co-heir with Christ. See, God is not interested in simply telling you what He wants you to do. He's more interested in revealing who you are. He's more interested in you knowing who you are. Now, He will certainly lead you into situations. But it's not because you need to do something, but because those situations will serve you knowing who you are. Some are getting it. Some are getting it. Because you're a co-heir. To be a co means you rule and reign with Christ. There are some attributes to your new nature in Christ that you're an overcomer. You're not under, you're over. So being an overcomer, there are some things that you have to overcome. Try being an overcomer, you never overcome anything. In fact, to be victorious, you need to go into battle. So God will allow you and direct you into situations and seasons that seem strange, but in those situations and seasons, it's where you get to exercise your authority. It's where you get to exercise your kindness. It's where you get to use your weapon of peace. It's where you get to use your mercy. It's where you get to exercise these things, reminding you that you're not who you used to be. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So while you're busy focused on what I meant to do, God says, it doesn't matter what you do. I will use that to reveal who you are. (laughs) <laughs> what, what do you think is a better situation for God to reveal who you are, a battle or a beach? Sitting on the beach all comfortable, expecting God to reveal the mighty warrior that you are. If you pray that prayer on the beach, expect a tidal wave to come so you can see if you can swim, overcome something. God's plan is to use every situation to reveal who you are in Him. That's why it's always yes. If it was about what you were doing, it would be conditionally yes. If you could just pick the right path that God had for you, if you could just get the exact career He had for you, if you could find the exact person that He planned for you to marry, then you would be doing the will of God. That's pressure. That's so much pressure. The pressure to get the perfect person. How many people got that? Husband, put your hand up. You're blessed. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's how we approach God's will. I got to get it perfect. I got to get it perfect. I got to get it perfect. So what we do to get it perfect to others is we blame God. We say, God said. God didn't say. God didn't say. And God's not going to say. He won't say. He won't tell you what to do. He leaves that to you. He leaves that to you. He gives you permission. He's not looking for perfection. He gives you permission so that whatever you do, He could work His will through it. He wants to employ your creativity. He wants to employ your passions. He wants to employ your gifts. He wants you to outwork those things in whatever way you want to work it. If you would just do it, don't need to say God said it. You just need to simply do it, invite God into it so He can work through it. Oh, help me preach up in the riser. I'm telling you, God wants you to actually just do something. Don't blame God. 
Don't say God said, because he didn't. He's waiting for you. You're waiting for God. God's waiting for you. You're saying, God, move. He's like, you move. You move and watch me move. You start doing something, watch me work my will through it. You start going on a career path, watch as I start blessing it. Yeah, there's going to be obstacles, but those obstacles are going to be the perfect platform for me to reveal that you are a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that you're more than an overcomer. Ah, (laughs) The spiritual people don't want to hear this. You want to tell you how God's going to prophetically lay out the path for you in every single detail so that you can glide along and speak in front of stadiums of people and thousands. That's not God's plan. God's not looking for you to do for Him. He's not a needy God. He's looking to do through you. <laughs> if I just give Him permission, if I give Him permission, permission, for God to reveal His power, His provision in my life. Does that mean then my current career could be an avenue for His will? Yeah. In my current marriage? Yes, absolutely. Don't quit that. You just got to allow God to move through it. You allow God to move through it. Stop saying God said to. You're freaking us out. Instead say, I'm going to give God every avenue of my life. The reason we say God said is because we we don't want people to debate us. We want people to believe us and not argue with us. When we say, hey, uh, God said to go, I have to go and do this. And then you're kind of like, well, if God said, what can I say? The only problem with that, well, there's a lot of problems. The main problem with that is you're actually minimizing the wisdom that someone might give you in a situation to help guide and direct, because God will use people, by the way. What's better is to say, I want to. Why is it bad to want? Why is it bad to want to change careers? I have people all the time, they tell me in one season, God told me this. In another season, they say, God told me that. I'm like, well, did God change his mind or did you? So don't blame God in the first place. Just have the ability to change your mind. Because God's into that. It's always yes. So you're saying, Pastor, I can, in my 50s, change my career and God, yes, yes. It's always yes. But hang on, what about if I make a mistake? It's still yes. Because God is so great that even in your mistakes, He works them for your purpose. Because the purpose isn't what you do. The purpose is who you become. God is trying to use even your worst mistakes to reveal His grace, His justice, His goodness, His kindness, His mercy, His greatness. He's trying to use all of it. It's always yes. When it's good, when it's bad, when it's awesome, when it's ugly, it's always yes, because God can always use it to reveal a greater dimension of who He is and how He wants to work His goodness through your life. What God will tell you, because He's not trying to tell you what to do, He's trying to tell you something though. You can't be sure of this, that God's trying to tell you that you can do it. He is trying to tell you that you are mighty. He is trying to tell you that you are more than able. You don't have to blame God for everything. Simply do it. Invite God into it so He can work through it. Come on, everyone repeat with me. Do it. Invite God into it so He can work through it. Come on again. Do it. So invite God into it so He can work through it. Do it. Invite God into it so He can work through it. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. I'm trying to set people free today. I'm trying to arrest some really erroneous notions that somehow God has one path for you. God says, hey, I am such a big God. That's why I want you to reign with Christ. 